This is Remote Daily, your daily dose of inspiration. We have been trying to encircle this topic of AI for the last couple of weeks and months and how it you know, impacts the future of work. So I actually want to ask you something very basic first to just help us understand today's topic. In your opinion, what is the biggest misconception about AI out there? What is something that most of us who are new to this don't see or understand? Well, I would say that the number one thing is that people uh, get really caught up in imaginary visions of AI, right? Uh, we all get distracted by the Hollywood uh, portrayals of AI. But what AI really is, is it's math. It's very complicated, beautiful math. And so if you've been feeling anxious at all about the future of artificial intelligence, especially where AI intersects with work, uh, there's been a lot of anxiety around that topic. Uh, it really helps to think about AI as math because math is really great, but nobody is that worried about like math you know, staging an uprising and taking over. And it's also pretty clear that math is what we use for a lot of situations, but it's not the answer for everything. So when we think about AI as math, it becomes more manageable. That is so helpful because just today when I uh, announced the session on our Slack, uh, John got back to me and said, hey, here's the new Terminator movie with ChatGPT. So this is fully in the realm of what you were just talking about. The Hollywood, the, the the dreamy, the big stuff that is so hard to comprehend. You say, folks, it's just math. Um, mm -hmm. Let's let's boil it down a second. So let's come to your to, to your specialty, bias in AI. Would you mind sharing with me, with us, maybe two examples where bias in AI is harming people right now in May 2023? Sure. Uh, so the new book, More Than a Glitch, Confronting Race, Gender, and Ability Bias in Tech, uh, has a lot of stories about uh, ways that people are being harmed by AI systems. Uh, instead of getting caught up in conversations about existential future risks, I really believe in focusing on actual harms being experienced today by actual real people. Uh, so one of the stories that I write about is uh, something that was discovered by the Markup, which is a really terrific algorithmic accountability news organization. Uh, and the Markup did an investigation of mortgage approval algorithms. So automated systems that decided who was going to get a mortgage. And what they found was that mortgage approval algorithms were 40 to 80% more likely to deny borrowers of color as opposed to their white counterparts. And in certain metro areas, this disparity was more than 250%. Right? So the algorithms were deeply, deeply biased against borrowers of color. If we want to think about why this happened though, we need to think about the technological factors and we need to think about the social factors, right? So let's think about how do we build something like a mortgage approval algorithm? Well, it is a kind of AI uh, that we call machine learning. It sounds like there's a little brain inside the computer, but there is not. Uh, machine learning does not mean the computer is learning like a human would. Uh, it's just another name for computational statistics. So when we build a machine learning system, what we do is we take a whole bunch of data and we throw it into the computer and we say, computer, make a model. And the computer says, okay, it makes a model. The model shows the mathematical patterns in the data. And then you can use that model to uh, make a decision, to make a prediction, to generate new text uh, in the form of sentences. You can use it to generate new images, right? It's a very powerful tool, but... The problem is that this mathematical model, which shows the patterns in the data, also shows patterns of bias and discrimination. So in our mortgage approval example, the 
algorithms being fed or trained on data about who has gotten mortgages in the past in the United States? Well, we know from the field of sociology that there is massive financial discrimination historically against borrowers of color. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also practices like uh, historical practices like redlining. Uh, there has been uh, traditionally residential segregation in the United States. So the data that's being fed into the algorithms uh, shows bias against borrowers of color. So that's what the algorithm gets trained on. And so those are the kinds of decisions that it perpetuates. Right. Now, we could build the system differently so that we put a finger on the scale and we make it more equitable, but nobody is doing that. Wow. So a systemic mistake, a systemic uh, era of humanity, racism found its way into, a, into math. Mm -hmm. And that is playing out and harming people right now this piece is from two years ago but as we can assume math has not stopped since it's continuing and it's happening right now is there another example maybe a personal example that you experience or experienced uh, that you can share with us that is not in uh, housing but in another uh, region of our daily lives that you have observed and put into the book that also shows how math is hurting us. Well, another example that I use in the book uh, is in the realm of medicine. Uh, so for many years, there was an algorithm that would uh, calculate your kidney function uh, in order to determine when you were eligible for the kidney transplant list if you were having kidney failure, right? So that, uh, that calculation was called EGFR, estimated glomerular, glomerular filtration rate. And when your EGFR was 20 or below, then you are eligible for the kidney transplant list, right? You're not at that point given a kid, new kidney, uh, you are just eligible to wait for a donor kidney to become available that matches you. So the problem in this algorithm was that uh, there was a racist belief embedded in the calculation. And then that racist belief got embedded in the algorithmic systems that were used to uh, you know, analyze patients' lab results and uh, programmatically put them onto the waiting list for a new life-saving organ. Uh, so that, that racist belief uh, was something called a race correction. It was based on the idea that Black people have greater muscle mass than other people which again is, uh, is not true, uh, is, a, uh, is an example of a, the, of a belief associated with the social construct of race getting, uh, getting kind of embedded as biological fact, right? Uh, and so because black people were thought to have greater muscle mass, they were given a multiplier in uh, calculating EGFR. And what that meant was that Black patients had to be sicker in order to qualify for the kidney transplant list. Right? And so when we build uh, new technological systems based on uh, older processes, which is, you know, which is what we do, that's how you know, how the innovation process works in most cases. You take the existing system and then you transfer it into the technical realm and then you try and optimize it a little bit. Uh, but we can't uncritically build systems because then we're reproducing inequality that already exists in the world, right? So data scientists, computer scientists need to get more familiar with the social science literature need to understand what are the very human problems that are embedded in the data or in the procedures that we're using to design our technological systems. Wow. It's so stunning to hear that. And I think the cases that you just mentioned, they're not from the chat GPT hyper area of the last couple of months. These things have been existing for years and you've been researching on them. Now, 
you yourself are one of the few non-white female researchers in artificial intelligence. And you are also one of the most prominent leaders in this field of algorithmic accountability that you actually say we have to hold math accountable because it's mm -hmm. made by people and we have to hold these people accountable. So personally, what, draw, what drew you into this field? It's not like as you said, it's easy to go over uh, at a cocktail party and especially not for the last couple of years. So what made you land there in the first place? Well, I started my career as a computer scientist and then I quit to become a journalist. Uh, so one of the things that I do is I build technology in order to commit acts of investigative reporting. Uh, and as an investigative reporter, you get very familiar with what are the uh, what are the problems in the world? Uh, how do we spot uh, problems and how do we hold uh, hold power accountable? Uh, in the case of the uh, of the kidney algorithm, I am really pleased to say that uh, that change did happen thanks to the efforts of activists, patients, doctors, advocates of all sorts, uh, they did change the way that the kidney formula was calculated uh, and did remove that race correction uh, in the past couple of years. And it happened actually while I was writing the book. Uh, so it was uh, like the change was, was that fast. Uh, one of the things I think about though, is I think about how hard it is to build technological systems uh, and how hard it is to update them. Uh, because when I heard that the uh, kidney algorithm was being updated, I thought that's so fantastic. And then I thought, oh yeah, must remember to go in and check if it's actually being updated or how quickly it's being updated at every lab in the country. Because just because the, uh, you know, the, kind of central authority makes a recommendation doesn't mean that it trickles down immediately to every place that is implementing an individual uh, individual calculation or an individual technology, right? That's a, yeah, that is a, that urge to double check and make sure a thing is happening is both a computer science urge and a journalism urge um, because both journalists and computer scientists know that there are a lot of details that fall through the cracks in computational systems. Wow. And of course, you were able to not only do these checks, you were also able to compile them into this book that came out in March, A More Than a Glitch, Confronting Race, Gender, and Ability Bias in Tech. Liz uh, will be so kind to share the cover with us once more. Uh, um, this magazine called it one of the most anticipated feminist books of 2023, which I find it interesting. Uh, way to, to to phrase it because I think it's for all of humanity. It's super. It's super super important to look at these cases and make sure that people are held accountable and that things are actually changing and that we know that the changes are happening. But other than collecting and investigating, what made you write this book? Like, what made you feel the urge to write a book about something that, as you just said, is constantly changing? Like, probably in the weeks since the book was published, new things probably have been added to that field already that should be in the book. So why did you write this book? Well, the ideas in the book are both dated and timeless, right? So the social problems that I'm writing about uh, are embedded in our technologies. It's not necessarily intuitive that social problems would manifest inside technological systems. And so even if I, you know, even if something is fixed, uh, one of the problems is fixed, like, I'm not too worried about that because, you know, that's great for the world. Uh, but uh, the point remains and there is, uh, there's absolutely another uh, another problem that is manifesting, right? So what do I mean by that? Well, uh, GPT uh, GPT two and GPT three had been published uh, by the time that uh, my 
print deadline hit for the book, uh, but ChatGPT had not come out. Right? Mm. So ChatGPT mm -hmm. is the wrapper, the interface on top of GPT-3. Uh, GPT-3 is like the underlying model. And now we have GPT-4, which is, you know, the next iteration of that underlying technology, right? So I and was able to write important about to add, Sorry to interrupt, the fastest mm -hmm. growing application in digital history. So as soon as this interface appeared, everybody literally wanted to use it. And mm -hmm. for you, I guess this was also uh, a sea change. Well, so what is interesting to me about the uh, chat GPT mania is that I, it was really good interface design that allowed the technology to take off. So the technology itself uh, was around for much longer than most people understand, right? But what OpenAI did that was new and really became sticky was they created a really easy to use uh, visual interface for uh, interacting with GPT-3, the model and all of its associated technologies, right? And the, like the chat interface was also uh, a bit of a, uh, a bit of a tweak. I mean, we had voice assistants, right? We already had things like Alexa and Siri that you could use to give commands and it would, you know, trigger a thing. Um, but the, uh, and we already had chatbots that did customer service, but combining that with the generative capabilities of something like Dolly or GPT-3, that was really the breakthrough. So now I think we have understood that you are writing a book about it because it's timeless. The problems that you're tackling have a timeless, unfortunately, um, systemic issue to them. And this is being translated into math and that math then ends up harming people without them even knowing. And it takes investigative journalism to look under the hood and understand that we have to reverse engineer these things in order to not harm us. But how does that actually work? Like what is your, maybe you can share one example for a suggestion to make sure that in the future we don't translate systemic racism and sexism and whatnot into technology, into math. Is there one solution, one example that you can share with us? So I think that uh, something that's tough is that we expect there to be an easy solution. We're used to this kind of narrative where we define a problem, we narrow it down to a single pain point, and then we write code against that pain point, and then uh, scale it up, commercialize it, take over the world, right? Like that's the the kind of pattern that we expect. Uh, but the problem is that we are at a point where all of the problems that are easy to solve with technology have actually been solved, right? What we're left with are very complicated problems. And so complicated problems do not have a simple solution, right? Uh, so I think that the, the place that we need to start in problem solving is we need to start by examining our assumptions about what technology can do for us. So for a very long time, we've been operating uh, collectively under a kind of bias that I call techno chauvinism. It's the idea that technological solutions are superior to others. Instead, what I generally argue is that we should use the right tool for the task, right? And sometimes the right tool for the task is a computer. Sometimes it's something simple like a book in the hands of a child sitting on a parent's lap. You know, one is not inherently better than the other, right? So when we stop uh, with the techno chauvinism, when we stop having a kind of automatic bias toward technology, uh, we can then examine what are our beliefs about the future. Uh, what are our beliefs about the future of technology and society? And we can discover that, oh, actually, 
uh, the kind of collective vision of the future actually comes from a small and homogeneous group of people, uh, and they are not necessarily correct. Right? So what I prefer is a frame that's given to us by Ruha Benjamin in her book, Race After Technology. And this is the idea that automated systems discriminate by default. Right? So if your default is thinking, oh yeah, it's going to be better to use an automated system because technology is more objective or more unbiased or more neutral. If you let go of that and you assume, oh, when I make an automated system, it's going to discriminate against somebody, right? Uh, possibly many groups by default, because that's how these things work, then it becomes easier to spot the problems, right? When you spot the problems, you can sometimes solve them using, again, mathematical methods. Sometimes you can't. And then, you know, in that case, you need to go to plan B, right? But we just can't assume that mathematical solutions, that technological solutions are going to deliver us from the essential problems of being human. Wow. I, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I wonder where that leaves us because the techno chauvinism, chauvinism, as you call it, as you call it also in your book and this belief that we have had over, I guess, the last couple of years, maybe even this generation was exactly in the opposite direction. Right. And even mm -hmm. now we have hit people on the show who said AI is going to help solving climate change, which is probably the, latest and most complex problem uh that we face so yeah it's just one example what? for I this would, deep belief i would challenge that like i would challenge the the conviction that ai is going to solve climate change because actually what's happening right now is that the amount of power and the amount of computing that's required to train ai models is enormously wasteful and is contributing to climate change and is using an unbelievable amount of water. And uh, you know, ecosystems are getting destroyed because of the strip mining that happens in order to mine the minerals that we use to build computers. So, I mean, I think people need to challenge the kind of automatic belief that you know, technology is better, that technology is leading us into a better future. And is there an organization that you recommend to support or follow? I'm asking because um, I guess many of us have seen these headlines. It was, I think, during the pandemic in 2020 when Google fired Timnit Gabriel, one of, I guess, your peers, we can call her, uh, one of the world's most prominent AI ethics researchers, uh, one of the, the few um, non-white female leaders at Google, it made, huge, it made huge headlines, and I guess it made some people lose trust in that Google is really taking accountability for solving what you just described. So are there any companies or are there organizations who are heading in the right direction? Can you point us towards you know, people or teams or organizations, companies to support because you feel, feel like they're questioning technology in the right way and they're working on solutions in the right way. So I can recommend uh, looking at DARE, the Distributed, Distributed AI Research Institute. Uh, that is Timnit Gebru's organization. Uh, there is also the Algorithmic Justice League, uh, which is headed by Joy Bolamwini, uh, who is uh, one of Tim Neat's colleagues uh, and they work together on the gender shades investigation. Oh, sorry, apparently there's a doorbell and the dog is freaking out about it. Uh, I can also recommend uh, work by uh, Safia Noble, who is the author of uh, Algorithms of Oppression uh, and MacArthur Award winner. Uh, she has an organization called C2I2 at UCLA that is really terrific. And Ruha Benjamin, who I mentioned before, has the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab at Princeton University. Wow, uh, thank you. I'm trying to um, share the links here in the chat uh, while we are speaking so that we can all follow up on this. Um, I also uh, just found uh, Ruha Benjamin's website here. So 
uh, ruabenjamin.com. Uh, then there is the uh, Algorithms of uh, Oppression work uh, published by NYU Press. And then the DAIR-institute.org, which was the organization that you mentioned first, Distributed AI Research Institute, all of them have newsletters, social channels. So thank you for sharing that with us, uh, Meredith, while your dog was freaking out. Um, that is uh, true, true non-AI multitasking. You are also uh, teaching data journalism at NYU. I grew up in a time and went to journalism at a time, uh, journalism school at a time where data journalism was not a subject matter yet, unfortunately. Uh, that's how old I am. Um, when you talk to your students right now, what are their biggest concerns about AI? What are, what are they questioning? What is the young generation of people that were born, born in this millennium um, concerned about? So they are really concerned about uh, issues like bias. Uh, they're concerned that AI systems are perpetuating injustice uh, and they are really interested in a kind of new field uh, that sometimes is referred to as critical internet studies, critical technology studies, critical data studies. Uh, and so the journalism folks uh, are still interested in all of the uh, traditional concerns of journalism, you know, holding power accountable. Uh, but with data journalism, we use new methods. Uh, we find stories in numbers. We use numbers to tell stories. We employ visual storytelling techniques. Uh, and so all of those strategies are really fun. Uh, a lot of my students are finding jobs in a, a new sector of uh, tech for social good that's called public interest technology, right? It's exactly what it sounds like. It's about creating technology that's in the public interest. So sometimes that means doing algorithmic accountability reporting, investigating black boxes, discovering that there is bias in uh, you know, recidivism prediction, uh, algorithms or facial recognition technologies. Uh, sometimes uh, public interest technology it means doing something like strengthening a government website so that it doesn't go down at the beginning of the next pandemic where you, know, you probably remember there were stories about millions of people filing for unemployment benefits at the same time and then the unemployment websites went down because they just couldn't handle the load, right? So our uh, public technologies, you know, our government technologies need updating, maintenance, repair the same way that our roads and bridges and tunnels do. You know, we need people with technological skills working in the government so that the government can work for the people. Right. So I remember. At NYU, uh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, well, at NYU is something called the NYU Alliance for Public Interest Technology that I work on. Uh, and we have a newsletter. Uh, we have lots of career resources for students. So if anybody is thinking about career switching or looking for a job, definitely check out Public Interest Technology. Wow, fantastic. I just shared the link, um, alliance.hosting.nyu.edu. And I also uh, shared a job board by Code for America Civic Tech Jobs, where you can just see how this market is is blooming. And I remember, I think it was in um, 20, I want to say 15, when Barack Obama spoke at South by Southwest, one of the biggest gathering of technologists in, in the United States. And his main message from the stage was, we need you. Uh, mm -hmm. We need you to come work for us. And this was eight years ago. And I wonder how it's been going because and to ask a final question around that, I hope that we hear some questions from you in the chat as well from, for Meredith. Many folks, when these conversations come up, we have to change the system in order that you know, the machines, the math is becoming uh, more equal and, 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 and less biased. Call for government, even here, uh, even more so in my native and over there in Europe, but even here, how is the government actually faring in this whole thing? Is it playing an important role yet? And what role do you think it should play? 
Well, the thing that I am most optimistic about right now is something called the Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. So that's something that came out from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, the kind of core idea is that it uses a human rights framework uh, to, uh, to talk about what AI systems should and shouldn't be doing. Uh, and one of the features that I like about this blueprint is that uh, it puts forth the idea that if an automated system makes a decision that goes against you, right? Like if it turns you down for a mortgage or turns you down for admission to a school, you would have the right to a complete explanation of what happened, you know, why this thing, why this decision was made. And then you would also have the right to talk to a human being right away. The human being would have to take you seriously and would have to be empowered to change the decision. Right? Thank That's you. really different than what happens now. Yes, and what a powerful statement. And I also uh, would like to remind uh, of the AI Act by the European Union. I just that think that document mm -hmm. just uh, was just press released a couple of days ago. Actually, yep. um, is there a geographical difference uh, between the two continents that is very stark, or or do you think sort of the Western world is kind of heading into a similar direction here? Well, so this is really interesting because the internet was not conceived of as something that has geographic boundaries, uh, but in practice, it absolutely does have geographic boundaries because it is a the internet is a terrestrial thing. Even though we refer to cloud computing and we imagine it happening, you know, up there in the sky somewhere, it's not actually happening in the sky. Uh, it's actually happening uh, on you know, in these giant cloud computing warehouses, which are located in physical space and are connected by wires and there are cables running under the ocean uh, connecting, you know, the US and other places. So it's a very, uh, it's a process that is based in physical infrastructure, right? Uh, one of the, uh, the big manifestations of this that I run into is uh, when I take my computer with me when I go to Europe and I try and stream a show and then I discover, oh, wait, my streaming platform doesn't work here, right? Or, oh, wait, the show is not available here, right? So you run into these kinds of, uh, these kinds of situations. Um, so we can think about the kind of physical infrastructure of computing and we can think about, all right, what's gonna happen with the EU AI Act? Well, we can pretty accurately forecast that uh, in the US, we are going to enjoy some of the benefits uh, that accrue to folks in the EU as a result of the new uh, EU AI legislation, because uh, we've also in the US uh, enjoyed some of the benefits of GDPR, right? Because uh, GDPR, which is you know the most comprehensive privacy, digital privacy regulation that has been implemented in the world to this point, uh, GDPR uh, has restrictions for EU citizens, but software developers don't want to make a different computer program for every single country, right? What programmers want to do is they want to write it once and run it anywhere. So the idea of having a different code base for every single country uh, just makes them shiver. So they kind of let everybody have the, uh, have the most restrictive technology, right? So whatever happens with the EU, uh, with regulation of AI, like that uh, regulatory capacity is going to be built into whatever software we have in the US as well. Um, and so hopefully, uh, you know, if companies do it right, uh, we will get to enjoy some of the benefits as well. Very interesting. I would like to close with a question about your, the future of your own profession from Brandon, um, who is asking in the chat, how pervasive automated journalism is uh, how it is growing and 
I would derive from that question how you see the future of your own craft in the light of AI. So it's kind of three questions wrapped in one. So mm -hmm. you're probably used to that. You're on stages all the time where moderators give you instead of one question, five in a row. Um, so let's start with yeah. the per pervasiveness, but then maybe you can also hone in on how you look at the future of your own profession uh, in this new era that we're in. So I am, I've actually been asked this question about the automated future of journalism a lot. And I've been asked this question pretty constantly for at least 10 years or so, if not longer, right? So journalism is one of the professions that people always feel like is under threat. It's one of the things that people go to first because guess what? People consume a lot of journalism. Journalism is top of mind for most people. Uh, and that is uh, both really great and, uh, you know, kind of problematic. Uh, so we have been using automated methods in journalism for a very long time, right? Uh, since before the chat GPT era, we've been using uh, automated methods to write stories. Uh, you might not have noticed it, but we've definitely been doing it. Uh, we try usually to label the things that we uh, that we write using automated methods. That's a really good practice. Um, and automated methods are good for writing really boring stories, right? So earnings reports, uh, when you report on corporate earnings, you're basically writing the same story over and over again. So for a very long time, we've had technology that's basically like Mad Libs. Like you push, you plug in the new earnings and it kind of writes a slightly different story, but it's basically the same story every time. So we have that, we've been using that. It's really good for things like, you know, reporting on little league baseball games, uh, which, you know, that's basically the same story over and over too. Uh, so AI is great for mundane stories. And if you have used ChatGPT at all, which I totally recommend everybody does because it's nifty, uh, you quickly discover that ChatGPT is great at generating text and the text that it generates is generally really, really boring, right? It has no spark. So sometimes that is useful. I mean, you think of an email autocomplete, like we've had predictive text or predictive suggested text in email for a really long, for what feels like a long time now. You know, yes, ChatGPT is a, you know, kind of souped up version of that. Uh, yes, it can like recycle Wikipedia articles. Like, yeah, it can do that. Uh, but that's not that interesting. So two things here. Uh, AI is good at generating mundane text. Mundane text is useful sometimes. It's not everything. And the urge to tell stories, the urge to communicate with each other, the urge to keep track of what's going on in your world is something that that never goes away. That is something that's eternal. So that's my vision of the future of journalism. We'll still need journalists because the stories that computers tell are boring and humans are inherently interesting. Wow, we've learned so much uh, from you today, Meredith. Um, we have learned that um, AI is really just math. Uh, I loved learning that that we have learned that we should all trust a little bit less in technology and more in us humans. And uh, that looking more at our society will actually uh, help solving some of these issues. Um, that also includes me trusting less in my camera. Uh, I was just switching over uh, to the second camera. We have to trust less in technology. I really take this as a very important learning from you today. And uh, we, we shouldn't trust AI to solve climate change, but trust us humans, if anyone, to solve it. And I, I think what we also learned from you is that there's community in this problem solving. I found it fascinating to hear from you how many people out there are already, you know, working on this every day. And uh, to just name uh, two, DAIR or D-A-I-R and uh, the NYU Alliance for, Public, Alliance for Public Interest Technology that you're a part of is worth supporting, signing up for, going to their events, donating, and really being behind what, what is being published there. And uh, it was also great to learn um, from you that 
AI and journalism is already a daily fact. Um, and is AI in your life right now, Meredith? Is it, are you trusting AI for your health, your life, your family every day? Is there any apps that you could recommend us just to close the session off? You know, it's that are actually so trustworthy. Yeah. Uh, so we've been, all been using AI for a really long time without realizing it, right? Every time you do a Google search, uh, you're activating something like 250 different machine learning models. Uh, when you use uh, a video conferencing system and you record it, and then you get an automated transcript, you're using AI, right? So you've been using, there's AI in Snapchat filters. Like you've been using AI for a really long time and not noticing it. It's just that when things are labeled AI now, uh, you notice it. And one thing that's so interesting to me is when we use AI, we expect it to feel special, right? We <laughs> expect it to be mm -hmm. like somehow magical, but it's not, it just feels mundane. It's just using technology, right? So it's our expectation of the specialness of using AI that is the problem. And with that said, um, I feel really special that we had the chance to chat with you today. I even went over time because I can't stop asking you questions. It's such a relief to so talk to somebody for having me. with a clear mind and a clear understanding of what AI is. Uh, there's no hype. There's no BS. There's no selling in what you say. It's just very clear and explanatory. And I appreciate your time so much, Meredith. Um, anybody who has their cameras on uh, or can switch their cameras on, I invite you all to share some virtual glitter for our amazing guest, the author of More Than a Glitch, data journalist, Meredith Bazaar. Meredith, this is for you from all of us around the world. Um, oh, I hope you can you feel so it much. tickle. <laughs> and um, we invite you, Meredith, uh, of course, to join us again uh, when you are working on your next project and join us again uh, when you have finished your next research. We would love to have you here again on Remote Daily. Thank you, Meredith Bruzar, and see you next week. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. This is Remote Daily. Mm -hmm.